Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money and Investing Show. This week we are looking at five things you probably didn't know about the stock market. There are plenty of things out there that people think, but are they really true? We'll explore those five as we dig in, give you a great rolling start to this, this year, and more importantly, the opportunity to make it your best one yet. Make sure you take plenty of notes, and as always, take plenty of action. Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money and Investing Show with me, your host, Andrew Baxter, and as always, my offsider and co-host, Mitchell Laurentiel. Thank you for having me on the show, Mr. Baxter, and to jump straight into things today, we're going to surprise a lot of our listeners out there. It's going to be a fun episode. Here we are in the new year, 2023, five things that you maybe didn't know about the stock market. Oh, gee whiz, only five. <laughs> only five. There's countless of these, but I reckon we can pick out the biggest five that we often encounter when we mm. chat to new and prospective clients. It's a good one, isn't it? And the typical questions are they come up on social media or on any of our feeds. And, f- and for that matter, for our listeners, make sure you hit us up on our social media. We'd love to engage with uh, with people that have, got a, uh, that have got a genuine interest in markets or indeed making money. So make sure you ask your questions. And I guess this podcast is uh, today is dedicated to those people that have asked questions like some of the ones that we're about to cover. All right. Well, jumping into it, number one, this will bamboozle a lot of people, and you can probably explain why, is that money is actually never lost in the stock market. It's a zero-sum game. Yeah, it's a pretty tough sell for people, especially after the last year or so that most investors have had in markets where you know, typically we've seen portfolios down you know, 15 20%. Uh, but the facts of the matter are true. The money is never lost in the stock market. And what I mean by that is that it is actually a zero-sum game. If someone is losing, someone has to be gaining because they're on the other side of the trade. It's as simple as that. So it's merely a transfer of ownership of wealth from a very, very large group of people that perhaps have either had poor advice or have been on the wrong side of the trade to a far smaller group of people that have made literally a killing. Uh, and that's that's the fact of the matter. It is a transfer of wealth. What's the conduit for the transfer of that wealth? Probably a better level of skill um, or strategy, in some cases blind luck. Uh, but nonetheless, typically yeah, there's a, there's an edge that involves that transfer of wealth. And that is uh, that is um, what this gig is all about, having the level of skill that puts you in the box seat to be the person that profits on the trade. Well, it's good to know that money's not falling sort of behind the couch somewhere in yeah, the no. stock market. Yeah, it's actually to, going somewhere. That's uh, FTX and crypto for that sort of stuff, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I did hear about that. That's last year's big story. I mean, you know, look at the billions that were, uh, were literally lost there where money was just transferred out to who knows who. Well, I guess it did transfer to someone at least, right? So it mm. didn't just disappear into thin air. It actually went somewhere, just not Certainly ethically, did. right? Mm. Mm. Crazy. All right. Well, money is never lost in the stock market. Now, I guess we talk about the edge as such, and the whole notion of that game is to accumulate as much as if you can of that wealth. Mm. How would you suggest going about doing that as a basic couple of pointers, AB? The key thing is, like anything, if you're going to be involved with any kind of enterprises, you want to have some level of skill. Yeah, anybody can go and open a sandwich shop. Will it be profitable and make money for you? Well, that rather depends on the work that you've done before you bought the shop. And then once you own the shop, how you choose to manage and run it. And trading is no more or less complex than that. So you do your work on the way in. You work out perhaps where you've got the best probability of success. And there are a number of ways you can do that. You can look at the chart obviously, which is what we call technical analysis. Also understanding maybe the fundamentals of what's going on in the economy. So, you know, if people aren't spending money, retail sales are pretty slow and there's low consumer confidence, buying a retail business is probably not the smartest idea. Equally, you know, at times when the consumer can't wait to spend money, that's exactly the space that you want to be in. So being able to quantify that through a level of research is is pretty important. Then once you've made the decision of, of, of what to buy and you're in it, how are you then going to manage that? And and the notion of just simply holding on to an investment for you know, an extremely long period of time, arguably forever, um, isn't probably the ideal way to make money in the current market and probably hasn't worked that well for the last four or five years. So you've got to have what we will consider to be an exit strategy. So what are you going to do to manage the business or the position that you're in? When are you going to take your profit? Or if it starts to go wrong, at what point are you going to cut it and move on to a different trade and go, well, that didn't work and, and, and time to move on. And that's really hard. It needs a level of discipline, uh, needs a level of skill. Uh, and that's the sort of stuff that we teach investors to give them the confidence to remove emotion and feeling away from that decision and replace it with hard, fast rules. Gotcha. Well, if we can carry on the the notion of edges, Mm. here's point number two that probably a lot of people didn't know was that in September, both the US and the Australian markets, seasonally speaking, September is the weakest month on average. (laughs) It's it's an interesting one. Why is it September? Because everyone always associates October uh, as being the bad month because the October crash was, funnily enough, 
in October. Um, but yeah, September statistically, um, yeah, one of the uh, members of our team, let's call him the alchemist in terms of that ability <laughs> to um, to go back through and look at a whole raft of different statistics. And I'm not just talking about which is the best or worst month to invest in, but you know, on um, which day in the cycle is it the best time to buy banks and things like that. You know, the guy's a genius at that particular uh, aspect of trading. And we go back through and crunch the numbers and yes, September statistically is the weakest month uh, for, for a number of reasons. Um, primarily though is obviously the market drifts lower. Uh, perhaps it's a reallocation of funds by people. Perhaps it's people getting out early ahead of what that was the October crash and what they're scared of um, and, and everything that's associated with that. So understanding that kind of seasonality to markets, you know, you can give you capital a break, pull it out at the end of uh, end of August, whack it back in at the end of September and miss out on that week month. And statistically, you're likely to do better than if you'd actually held your investments through that period of time. Equally, trying to time the market, and I think Tony Robbins talks about this um, you know, very, very well um, in, uh, in his uh, book, Unshakable, is that trying to time the market is not that easy for a lot of people, um, you know, because you'll always find a reason to then not get back in uh, when it comes to October the 1st, or maybe maybe the 3rd might be a better a day or so I start next week and you miss that couple of days where you get the outperformance. So you've got to have, you know, again, a level of strategy behind it. It's not just a question of, well, oh, pull my money out in September and then I'll get back in because chances are you won't get back in. Yeah, it's interesting you say that. And there's a number of other seasonal biases that we often trade on in our yeah. trading lab, you know, particularly end of December, really bullish period of time for yeah. stock markets. The old notion, sell in May and stay away for the yep. Aussie market. There's That's a number right. of these out there. Absolutely. And if you go back over time and you can use those as as value adds, I think it comes down to, for our listeners, how sophisticated do you want to make this game? Because you can make it, you know, uh, you know 4D surround sound, um, you know, total, um, you know, immersion business or you can be a little more arm's length in what you do and, and you know the deeper you get on that rabbit hole and look at all these different nuances of value add into your trading you do run the risk of what we call analysis paralysis whereby there are so many things that you're looking at and perhaps one or two of those indicators or, or measures that you look for are quite positive but then you look at a couple of others and they're quite negative that then leaves you in a state of con confusion and then you do nothing uh, and then it becomes very very hard to get back into the game so you do have to be pretty ruthless in terms of the process that you use, but certainly seasonality can be uh, can be quite a useful tool. And yeah, sell in May and come back later in the year is one that uh, statistically does stand up to a level of scrutiny. But again, depends on what you're investing in. Got it. And it all comes down to experience as well, which mm. is kind of the next topic I want to bring up, AB. Stock market's pretty old. It's almost as old as you. It's been around since the 11th century, which yeah. is really damn old. Not many people <laughs> would know that it's in fact been around for that long. Yeah, look, the market's have been it feels like longer sometimes even in my short period of time of 30 odd years and 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 look things have evolved massively over that period of time but the the underlying process or or or, or idea behind the market was to better put a buyer and seller together in a room where they were able to trade something that was um standardized to an extent and for a price that could be readily agreed and then over a period of time add in um a de-risking of that transaction where you knew if you shook hands on the transaction, which we used to do, um, then you were guaranteed that you're going to get paid. And and those foundations, and I think actually the first stock exchange was either in Europe, wasn't it? Either Amsterdam or Frankfurt. I can't remember. History is not my thing. Making money is. Um, but like even if you if you sort of look in London, um, you know, the, the original sort of stock markets in London were run at coffee houses or counting houses. You know, there's a great pub called the Jamaica Inn, known as the Jam Pot, uh, in the Square Mile, just around the corner from uh, from the Bank of England and the Royal Exchange there. And that was one of the first stock exchanges in London where merchants would go to meet to to, to engage in their transaction, and they'd shake hands over the barrel, and and, and, and that was the the transaction done. And, and you kind of move that forward to today's world, which is obviously. You know, in the case of London, actually exactly in the same place. It's still in the square mile, the city of London. Interesting, a lot of people don't realise is London's actually two cities. There's the city of Westminster, which is London, and then there's the square mile, um, uh, which is uh, the city of London. So you've the city of Westminster, city of London. City of London is the financial district. And, and you know, to this day, that's where, you know, really is the epicentre of financial markets. And, you know, if you look at the, 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 the word being your bond, which was the original sort of maxim in the stockbroking industry. And I, I think there are a few charlatans that have come into the industry since then, which have probably gone a long way to undermining um, that level of trust. 
But the process of a market and what it creates is something that's called novation. And this is why trading regulated markets is so important. And that means if you engage in a transaction on a regulated market, uh, uh, an exchange traded market, y- you're the, the, the other side of the trade, the fact is that you will get your money guaranteed on the day it's supposed to come. And that was always the premise of shaking hands over the barrel way back in the day. So those early values have translated through. It's just screen based and significantly quicker into more decimal places and uh, and on far bigger amounts of money. Maybe it'd be nice to go back to the old Jamaica room for a pint and, uh, and yeah. a handshake over a barrel and uh, do a deal that way too. But uh, yeah, that's how it all started. And, uh, and the key thing is in the genealogy of why it started that way, that's still what markets are based on now. So, you know, when something is right, uh, it stands the test of time. So that trust notion, that idea that you guarantee that you're going to get paid what you're owed on a transaction is still very much what the markets are based on now. All the way from the 11th century AB to now, it's crazy, isn't it? It is. seems like an awful long time ago when you think about that, lots happened. And yeah, even in the last yeah, 20, 30 years where you've gone from an open, or well, 30 years ago from an open outcry system um, to screen-based uh, trading to the seat system in Australia, which, you know, the online trading system, uh, the automated uh, trading system in Australia seats, that was introduced just before the 87 crash. That's so been with us for an awful long time. Wow. You know, so there's even technology that's used today that's, that's yeah, actually relatively old in today's world. And, uh, and you know, the Australian seat system is a good example of that. Speaking of global markets, here's number four. Most mm-hmm. people wouldn't know about the stock market is that the US stock market alone actually covers about 50 or makes up about 55 percent of the entire global stock market well that's a, it's a it's a juggernaut right and 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 here we sit in a time where you know, at the top of the leaderboard for the world's biggest economies obviously you've got the us you've got china india is nudging through there now and, and yet the us has managed to maintain from a from a listed securities or stocks perspective that lion's share of what the markets are and i think it's testimony to is a lot wrong with America. Let's say that. And I say that as someone that very happily spends time there. I've got a great business there. I love the country and I love the people there. There are a few flaws. On the other side of the coin, that entrepreneurial spirit, which was the backbone of why over the years, as you saw yourself from Ellis Island when you're in New York over Christmas, um, the spirit of the immigrants that moved to the US of their own volition build a country um, that, that is just so entrepreneurial. And, and if you look at the, the different innovations that have gone on there in the technology space or in the consumer space or in the uh, manufacturing space or in the service space, it, it's, been, it's been the benchmark for the world. Uh, and when America sneezes, the world catches a cold. That's the, the leadership aspect that it's had traditionally. And from a stock market perspective, yeah, 55% of it. You think about the world's biggest companies, you know, whether it's in the banking sector or whether it's Apple in the tech space or whether it's Starbucks or McDonald's in the restaurant space. Like they're just bemoth organizations that aren't just American, they're truly global. So yeah, not surprising to see. Now, what that does do, of course, is from an investor's perspective. So if we're talking to our audience here in Australia, for example, example, your investments in the stock market are probably 60, 70, 80% focused on Australian companies. Yet Australia is only what, one and a half percent of the global economy. And then for some flavor, your financial advisor might give you maybe a five or 10% allocation to overseas equities. Yet overseas equities by way of the US is more than half of the global economy. So really the asset allocation should be the other way around, should be holding far more overseas equities and a far smaller amount of Australian equities. But I guess whenever you talk to investors in any country, and I've seen this from speaking around the world, People are very parochial. They want to invest in their own backyard because they can touch and feel the companies. You know, what does Fortescue do? Or, you know, what's West Farmers and Bunnings all about? Well, if you live here, you know that. Whereas if you're talking about a country, a company that's on the other side of the world, you don't understand what makes it tick. So you feel maybe less comfortable um, investing in it. And that in itself is a problem because you're making your decisions based on how you feel rather than the actual logic and process behind where's likely to be the best investment. That is a number of good points there, AB. It's crazy. When you actually think about it, Bamoth organizations, as you say, considering, for example, that Apple has more money in the bank than some countries, it does probably lend itself- Probably most countries at the moment, I should Probably most that. countries. It does yeah. lend itself to a myriad of opportunities, yeah. which kind of draws into that, our very last one today, number five, mm. uh, is that probably a big one of the, the biggest myth, single myths in the stock market is that you have to take on more risk to generate a higher return. Is that necessarily the case? 
Uh, no, uh, let's <laughs> just put the, the, the pin in that nope. balloon, balloon straight away. You know, it, it's one of those things in life, Mitch, when something's said often enough, it almost becomes a truism because it's all you've heard. Oh, more return you need to take or more risk. In actual fact, that's not necessarily the case because the way to reduce your risk is to upskill. The more you know and the more skilled you are, the lower your risk then becomes. Uh, and so you can then generate more return because you're more skillful and you've reduced your risk. So if I were to, to, to give you an example, uh, by learning prudent risk management as a skill set, so something really simple like a stop loss, which at its most basic level is if the share price starts to move against you, you set a level where that's where you're going to exit the position. And you go, well, I've made a loss here. Yes, you have. And I'm reminded of one of the one of the pieces of advice I was given on very, very early in my career, not in the 11th century, I might add, uh, but during my, my, my time in London, one of the old timers said to me, always remember this, all big losses used to be small ones. The only reason it became a big loss is because you chose to let it get out of control. Don't ever let that happen to you. It was great advice. Great advice, yeah. And so making a small loss and getting out of a position takes away your risk on the trade. Whereas sometimes people will hold on to something because they're either stubborn or they know no better. They haven't been educated and skilled on the nuances of trading and investing on the basis that they're told, oh, you just hold blue chip shares for long term, they always come back. That's not true. And so by doing nothing, you're exacerbating your risk. Learning, you're reducing your risk. Secondly, um, yeah, by upskilling, you've got the ability through smarter strategy to be able to augment returns. So if we were to talk about, you know, one of the strategies that's meat and potatoes for our organization here in Australia is a strategy we call cash on demand, which effectively is covered calls. And if you were to look at the performance of the ASX 200 over a 20 year period. So I'm not going to curve fit here. I'm going to pick a, a pretty decent chunk of time, 20 years. And then compare that to the performance of the XBW, which is the buy and write index. Over that same period of time, the buy and write index, the covered call index, for want of a better description, has massively outperformed the ASX. Massively, not like two or three percent, but really substantially outperformed over that time frame. Now, here's an example where what you've done is made a substantially bigger return. But using a buy and write strategy, even according to the ASX's website itself, is lower risk than owning shares outright. So less risk and greater return over 20 years. Perfect example Speaks for of itself, that. doesn't it? But it requires some upskilling to get to that level where you can apply that strategy. So yeah, you don't need to take on more risk to make more return. You can diminish your risk by learning what to do and accessing some different sorts of strategies, not getting carried away and punting on the market and day trading and trying to you know, do reverse back spreads and all this sort of stuff, just keeping it meat and potatoes. And you can generate some really great return and reduce your risk at the same time. So yep, that's the pin in that balloon. And those two statistics I just quoted you, the charts on the ASX website, and so too was that quote a little while ago. I like that. That's really good, AB. That wraps up our five um, five things that people don't know about the stock market. Awesome. We've, got, we've got a bonus from you, please. Can I put you out throw <laughs> you, you under the you, bus? You're giving you value for money. This is a New Year's resolution on your part. You're going to put me to the sword here, right? Yes, please. <laughs> what have you got for me? I'm very nervous now. Okay, well, what, here's, here's a bonus. Mm. Most people think that trading the stock market is hard, which it's not easy, but being good at it is simply a process. It's not rocket science. Mm. What are your thoughts? Yeah, look, for anyone that thinks investing in the stock market is hard, what's your definition of making it hard? There's probably the fact that it's an unknown and it's something you may be less familiar with. So if you're less familiar with something, it, you, you, the, the, the brain has this terrific uh, ability to make things seem different, like Christmas just passed, right? So I'm playing with the kids who are down at the beach and it's a bit of an overcast day. And you know when you're, you're a little bit windy, it's overcast and, uh, and you think, oh, that's a bit fresh. And the kids, come on, Dad, get in the water. And you go, yeah, it's probably going to be a bit cold in there. And all of a sudden your brain's telling you that oh, it's, it's going to be cold. In fact, you get in and it's warmer than being stood on the beach. But that's the mental dialogue that you can have with yourself when something is an unknown. And for many, many people out there, the stock market is this unknown. Oh, it's the big casino. You're just gambling. You know, everyone loses money, da, 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 da. All the usual myths that you hear out there that are always widely propagated by the loudest voice that's got no real view. Everyone's got, a, everyone's got an opinion, but not that many of them are informed. Um, so yeah, a lot of people look at it as being hard. It's actually a relatively straightforward business compared to um, most business and investments that you can do out there. It's pretty straightforward. Um, yeah, it's easier than buying a property. Yeah, that's something that people think is fairly easy. You know, you go to the bank, get a loan, buy a property. 
But what you've signed up for is 25 years of payments. You may or may not have a tenant in there. The market value could move up or down. You've got rates to pay. Depending on your entity, you could have CGT that you've got to deal with. Sure, uh, you've got all that insurance. Kind of stuff. It could call? get burned down. It could be a compulsory purchase. It could be so many things that happen. Rates could move up. Rates could move down. You could lose your job and inability. That's hard. Yeah, most people would see that easier because, oh, it's bricks and mortar. You can see it. You can touch it. So it's an easier investment. It's passive. It always goes up. All the rubbish that you hear um, compared to the stock market, which is in this sort of black box of mythdom. So, no, it's not that hard. And, and, and you know, it's definitely easier than digging ditches for a living. I've done that. And I can tell you it's not that much fun. Um, the stock market is significantly easier than that, too. So we, what do you do to make it easier? Start learning, and and I guess you know as we're at the start of the year, we sort of point out where our goals and values might sit for the year. And some people call them New Year's resolutions; others have got a plan. One of the things I'm committed to doing this year, and it will be published this year. I'm going on record now. Uh, we've got a book uh, that we've been working on for a very short period of time. Actually, it's something I, I, I largely wrote over the Christmas holidays, and um, and that is all about deciphering this journey into investing and actually making it very very easy, step by step playbook. Depending on what age group you're in, what decade of your life you're in, it'll tell you what you could and should be doing and then give you some insight as to what those things are. So my suggestion to anyone that's looking at this going, oh, the stock market's pretty hard, why don't you find out a bit more about it and then you'll realise actually, you know, something is actually pretty easy. Shh, don't tell anyone. I won't. But it's actually a lot easier than what people think and jumping in with no skills, that is gambling. That is punting, just like doing anything without a skill set is, is, is high risk. Taking the time to learn a little more about it pick up one of our programs or follow a lot of the free stuff we've got on our social media uh, feeds or, or to take up that book money and investing have a have a look at these things and start to upskill and you realize that just like getting in the ocean on that overcast day that was a little bit windy it was actually warmer in the water than it was out of it which came as a surprise but it was also a fact and yet my brain was trying to cloud my mind saying you don't want to get in there it's cold got to be very careful what you listen to especially um, those conversations that you may have heard so many times just because you heard it doesn't make it right. Do the thing, you should have the power, as they say, AB. Great episode. I think we've covered off five really important topics there that most people wouldn't have known, plus that bonus one there, which was really sage advice. So thank you very much for today. Upskill. Make this your best year. We're at the start of the year if you're listening to this. And you know, if you're listening to it on repeat or it's later in the year, this is what we're talking about at the start. And I do hope that this year has been what it needs to be. If you need help to upskill, to demystify it, to validate or learn more about some of the things that we've talked about, um, just become part of our ecosystem. Jump in. There's a ton of free stuff to consume. There's a, st- there's a ton of premium stuff in there to consume. And if you want to get great results, it requires a new set of skills because average skills give average or less than average results. Well said, AB. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Anytime. There you have it, guys. Make sure you give us a review and a rating and we'll look forward to hosting you on next week's show.